here is the stark reality of this. The mm -hmm. culture is a reflection of our thinking and our actions, and especially big organisations. The organisational culture is a direct mirror of how our senior leadership team are operating, how they're thinking. Because under stress, under hard times, how we think ourselves is how we act and how we act, the organisation will follow. It's only natural that people follow what we do. So when we're talking about organisational culture in that sense, we've really got to go back to the people that are leading the organisation and understand and examine what they're doing. Welcome back, folks, to another episode of Beyond the Numbers. I'm your host, Chris Thompson, and on this occasion, I'm joined by Andrew Garland, who is an action coach in Whitney, Ottershire. Now, a while back, I attended a networking group in place of a colleague, and Andrew presented at it. I found myself enthralled as he spoke about business culture, and in particular, zeroed in on a great phrase concerning why the fish rots from the head down. I simply had to get him on here to enlighten us about all things culture. So in this episode, you'll discover how culture is absolutely essential to business success, how things have gone wrong in the past, where culture starts, the key components that make up a great culture, and how to gauge success. Happy listening, folks. Andrew, thank you so much for joining me. Absolute pleasure to see you. It's my pleasure, Chris. Anytime. Love to get on the airways and talk about the things I like to talk about. And how are you doing on this uh, rather grey and um, drab day? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's the weekend. It's Friday. I love Friday evenings. You know, there's always something for us to look for, but everything's on the horizon. Everything is positive. If we exactly. see the day is dull, it's going to be dull. So if you take a positive view, it's going to be positive. Forget the weather. It's all good. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps, um, perhaps starting this, perhaps you could sort of just give us a bit of a brief background as to you, because you, you're an action coach, but how did you get to become an action coach? What, what's the sort of history there, please? Okay, thanks, Chris. Yes, I'm a senior partner, I own the franchise for Whitney, West Oxfordshire. Um, it's quite a long story. I started off as an aircraft engineer um, and very quickly discovered I had um, this sort of sense for looking at numbers and working with people. And I found myself in people leadership roles and business leadership roles. And, you know, one of the big things that struck me early on was when all my team walked out on me, um, whose fault was it? And, I, you know, I had to do some really deep diving into actually it was me. And, you know, that, that insight led me into all kinds of roles. I went back to university. I studied a, um, an MBA, a, a MCOM. I looked at all kinds of aspects of business. And starting off as, as a as small but meaningful roles, and it, as an aircraft engineer, I ended up being in senior management roles across all kinds of different sectors. And along that journey, I've sort of taken that belief with me that it all starts in your own mind. And in many respects, a, a business, an organisation is like a human body. Um, the main computer sits at the top, and if it's not running the right subroutine, you know, we're in trouble. So uh, over the course of working through many different sectors, many roles, senior roles, CEOs, MDs, operations directors, sales director, um, that principle has stuck with me um, all that time. Excellent. So obviously today's vlogcast, podcast is is primarily around the topic of culture. I'll just give a little bit of a background. So I, we were at a networking group called Open Doors. And uh, I think this was last November. And you gave, I think what they call an insight, a bit like a presentation, right? Indeed. On uh, a topic that, with the header, the fish rots from the head down. And uh, I was obviously listening to this and found it fascinating and thought, that would make a great sort of interview, podcast, vlogcast uh, subject, hence why we're here. So obviously, this is all about culture. Um, and I'm assuming that you deal with quite a few clients on this topic. What, what is it usually, what are the circumstances that usually lead someone to come to you on this particular area of work? Okay. There's sort of two two areas that I, I find that work comes from me. One is from CEOs, executives running um, large organisations, 
and just you know the standard run-of-the-mill business um, owners that are struggling they don't understand why things are not working and, and there's a common thread between the two of them um, in the sense that with CEOs are saying well where's a, why is my performance not where it should be you know I've given them everything they want I've I've, I've put things in place but nothing seems to be happening and same from a, a business owner um, a small to medium-sized business owner they're just looking at it saying well what's going on and that's normally the lead in to the discussion right so are they looking at They've obviously invested whatever that investment may be, and they're then looking at the output or the numbers, and they don't see the correlation between the two. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So there's there's a, there's a number of areas. One might be the 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 correlation of actual physical results that the business is looking for, and the other might be well, you know, this culture doesn't seem right. You know, we people are talking behind my back. You know, they, we we don't get on well all those sorts of things. So those two areas are the two key drivers for people stopping and saying, okay, well, what do we need to do about this? And how big is this line of work for you? Well, um, I, I suppose I've been a, a student for many years, but I've come to the realisation this is probably one of the biggest topics in business leadership and business management there is um, to have. And it really is just like a chip off of the um, iceberg, so to say. Beneath the surface, um, there is going to be so much development, so much going on in this area, um, especially for self-development. Right. Okay. So what you're sort of saying is there's a bit of a culture problem that you can see amongst many organisations, or they identify it themselves, the leaders. What, why is it that culture is so important, please, in your opinion? So let, let's get something right. You know, there's a there's a bit of mystery around this word culture. You know, everyone talks about culture of this and culture of that. Here is the stark reality of this. The mm -hmm. culture is a reflection of our thinking and our actions, and especially big organisations. The organisational culture is a direct mirror of how our senior leadership team are operating, how they're thinking. Because under stress, under hard times, how we think ourselves is how we act and how we act, the organisation will follow. It's only natural that people follow what we do. So when we're talking about organisational culture in that sense, we've really got to go back to the people that are leading the organisation and understand and examine what they're doing. Um, as scary as that might sound, putting a mirror up to people, um, that's the truth of it. So, in fact, what you're saying is behaviour is mimicked, when it's, particularly when it's coming from the top. Absolutely. And if there's a lack of consistency across the organisation, this is where people take the advantage. Well, not necessarily take the advantage, but they see that there is um, one rule for one and, and another for other others. And and this is probably one of the biggest dysfunctions inside of an organisation. So if we take that to a high level, if we're not consistent with ourselves, in other words, what are we saying to ourselves? What are we talking to ourselves about when no one else is around? versus what are we talking to people um, when they are around, um, I think you'll find in many cases where organisational challenges and cultural challenges, so to say, that's where the root lies. Right, okay. And so my, my feeling, and feel free to correct me on this, is that this has become a bigger and bigger and bigger issue over recent years. I, I suspect the, uh, the financial crash all those years ago, 2008, 2009, had something to do with it. Um, I don't know. Do you agree? And what do you think has gone wrong over the years? Because my feeling is maybe in the 50s, there was quite a good business organisational culture where a job perhaps was for life and people were very loyal to an organisation. Fast forward 60, 70 years, and we seem to be at the complete opposite end of that. How, how, what are your thoughts on that, please? Yeah, look, that, that's a great observation. In the, in the 50s and 60s, absolutely, people were employed for life, or they felt as though they were employed for life. Um, unfortunately, as technology has changed and as economic models have shifted how we think and how we do things, um, and that's brought about a different, brought about into the business world a different way of thinking. You know, the carrot and stick, we reward them heavily, and if we don't, if they don't deliver, they're out on the organisation. Well, that whole concept is gone and the whole concept now is actually 
let's understand how I can perform better so I can allow others to perform better. Yeah, and, and in terms of business owners um, and executives, the same sort of concept sits there that when I reach my glass ceiling, the business reaches its glass ceiling. So if we can get people to start thinking about how they're reacting, how people are seeing that, how they're influencing the organisational culture, the feeling of the organisation, then the quicker and the sooner those businesses, those organisations, those companies can break through that glass ceiling that they're, they're seeing. So culture is in effect, or as you were talking about it, is effectively starting with whoever the senior personal leadership is. And it's very much, am I right in saying, a, a, a one-on-one coaching or mentoring set of sessions with them. Is that correct? That's how I see it. You know, and, and I will state that you know, there's a lot of books written on this, this material. You know, this is my opinion on how I see the world, but it seems to be playing out. Okay. Do you think we're we're gradually then shifting away from the sort of late seventies, early eighties emphasis on shareholder supremacy and, and everything is done for shareholders and their investment? Are we are we gradually getting away from that now? I think there's a massive move um, away from the single stakeholder being the shareholder driving everything. If we now look at what's happening in terms of the pollution, the the greenhouse effect. All those, there's so many different stakeholders um, that have an influence or are being influenced by an organisation. So if we want to have a steady and strong future with that, you know what, we've got to start thinking about all those stakeholders. Right. And, and more importantly, um, the old adage of team, together we achieve more, um, you know, that was a great thing that started back in the 70s and 80s. Well, we've gone beyond that now. This is about how we think, how we interact with each other more than just how the team gets on. Mm. So if we look at those stakeholders, I'm thinking back to your November presentation, which was a while ago. <laughs> how, how does that work? How, what, can, you, can you run us through that dynamic? Well, we've got certain investment organisations now are looking at ethical investing. Yeah. And, you know, OK, the, the return on investment is perhaps not as high as the other high return um, listed companies. But what we are seeing is we're starting to see some of those ethical investing um, organisations, their returns growing, getting higher. Um, there's more support for those types of organisations who perhaps are economically, sorry, um, e- ecologically friendly um, for organisations that are taking a positive step towards using green energy or renewable sources. There's definitely a shift in that area. And if we also consider our communities who are now becoming more vocal about what they should and shouldn't be buying and why and why they shouldn't be buying certain products and services. And I, I think this is all this is all growing. It might s- seem small now, but it's absolutely becoming an exponential um, impact upon organisations. So when, <clears throat> when obviously you're a leader, obviously you, ha- you may have shareholders on one side, employees, staff on another, your managers in between, you're potentially faced, obviously every business is different, with a lot of competing different needs. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's you, know, you know, how many balls do you have in the air at any one time? You know, you could have four or five. Um, but we don't necessarily have to see it that way. We can see it that way as, you know, these are consultative inputs to us creating the necessary outputs. Right. Okay. So you're, st- you're in this line of work. You start, say you... Say I come to you and go, Andrew, you know what? I'm really struggling with my team, my team dynamic. The first thing that you're going to do with me is what exactly? Hold the mirror in front of me. I'm going to to get you to hold the mirror. Okay. And um, and I'm going to get you to understand what's going on with you. But the second thing I'm going to do, which is going to quite closely follow that, I'm going to do an organisational 360 review of you. Right. What we're going to understand from that. Um, this is not about blame or beating someone up, but it's understanding what is the dynamic going on. And we're going to learn about what people um, like about you or don't dislike about you. But more importantly, how, how they feel they can get on with you in the workplace, whether they see you as a strong leader, whether they actually understand their roles. You know, there's a lot of fog out there because people, they employ them some sometimes senior roles and they're actually not sure what they should be doing or achieving. So, gathering all that organisational information right from the, the driver, right from someone that, 
that might serve the coffee or, or whatever they might do in an organisation. We're going to put all that together and we're going to present it in a way that you're going to look at it and you're going to say, wow, is that really going on? <laughs> is that what really happens in our business? Now, you know, part of being um, on that learning journey is to say, you know what, I accept that. So what can I now do? What can the business now do? What can the organisation do to address some of those things? And that's a starting point. A lot of the times, it's behavioural driven. If your behaviour is such, then the organisational behaviour is such and everyone else tends to follow suit. Interesting. So why, interesting, particularly on that last point, why do so many leaders struggle to see the wood through the trees? (laughs) You know, I think, you know, no one at birth is taught how to be a great leader. You know, um, and 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 no one at birth is actually taught how to do sales either or run a business. And it's one of those things where the more you can learn, the more you put yourself on a on a learning for a life learning process, the easier it becomes to be, you know to look at yourself, assess, um, and become aware, mindful, being present. Actually, you know, one of those things called active listening is is, is lost. If we can just actively listen to the people that are working with us um, and understand and hear the message rather than um, not actively listening and hearing the message that we want to hear. So it's a bit like confirmation bias. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> so would, would you say the, the key, what are the key traits for a, a great leader, do you feel? Well, a great leader... As Simon Sinek signed, um, sort of um, summarised, I think the other day on LinkedIn, is a visionary. Now, right. if we've got great leaders that, that are direction orientated, um, how, do, how does the how does the vision, how does the energy, how does the encouragement come from the top if it's just directing? A great leader needs to be the visionary officer of the organisation, where someone have actually got something to grab hold of. They identify with it. They see a future. They can see their part in all of that. If we did one thing in every single organisation, business, community run or whatever FTSE listed, if we can just get the vision across to the people and people, the employees will either buy in or buy out of it. And those that are buy out of it won't work there. Those that are buy into it will ultimately deliver the competitive advantage that most businesses are looking for so i think simon Sinek put on linkedin he said we need to scrap the title ceo chief executive officer and have more chief vision chief yeah chief vision officers cvos is that right yeah that's what he said i am not i'm not sure that i i agree with you know changing the title i think it's it's more about either changing the people or getting to change people to change the way they think and um, getting people to change um, their approach to serious leadership roles. And if we can graduate above the the old carrot and stick or directive um, styles of some of our CEOs in this country, more towards the visionary thinking where they actually give people something to lock on to, I think we can do incredible things in this country. So, I mean, we hear all sorts of stories about people like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, are you sort of saying, because I mean, to all intents and purposes, they, <laughs> they're not necessarily the most forgiving or easygoing with their employees. <laughs> I think, you know, that there are instances where, um, you know, jobs would demand, well, well, I want a glass screen on it, not a plastic one. Well, that, that would take years to develop. You've got two months or, um, or Musk, you know, asks, how much will that rear suspension cost? You know, this revolutionary suspension of, Probably a, a few mil. You've got you've got half a mil, and and yeah. a few days. <laughs> but they think, do seem to get away with it. Yeah, the, the thing is, it's not about actually giving getting away with it. You know, as much as we might buy into a vision, we also need challenge in an organisation. Yeah, and w- without challenge, we don't break through the comfort zones that we're all all residing in, and that can be done in the right way. Of course, setting that 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 almost impossible task actually becomes possible by getting the thinking, the, the, the mainframe in our brain thinking about different routes. But 
if we're not given the if we're not given the challenge at a high level and at a low level, then we're not going to see those things. But examine the examine the vision of those two organisations, and I guarantee you'll see something quite powerful and strong. And if you also start to examine some of the uses of technology and examining the the sort of exponential growth of different things happening in the marketplace, combine those two, which those two organisations jumped on, that's what's led to the success. So they have an incredibly strong vision and they understand their role in terms of evolving or revolutionising the marketplace. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. For for example, if you look at the average micro trip, that's doubling, doubling its capacity every year. So for over the last 50 years, um, smart organisations are starting to see that those sorts of changes in technology will enable things to happen, whereas in the past they would have been seen to be impossible. Yeah, yeah, remarkable. So obviously when you go in, you're, you're, by the sound of things, you're doing an element of measuring in terms of what the leader's performance is, what the vision is, goals, that kind of thing. Do people understand their roles? Needless to say, then there's a, a bit of sort of truth telling for those in top positions, which can't be an easy discussion. <laughs> yeah, you know, if, if a CEO um, is has asked me to come in and, and um, engage and understand what's going on, then what you normally find is they're very open to receiving the information. In fact, they're very grateful to get the get someone to tell them the truth rather than having other people telling them what they they think they might want to know. And I think um, that's where the credibility, that's where the integrity lies, that's where the greatest growth will happen when those CEOs, those senior executives actually are listening to what um, is being fed back to them. What Listening to that, what I'm almost hearing you say is you're making them potentially not just more human, but a better human being. Yeah, yeah. We all put on this on this planet to be the best of each other or best of ourselves. Yeah, well, I'd hope so. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like we all get a bit lost in the in, in the fog almost. Yes, yeah, you know, that, that word fog is a really, really interesting one. And in a recent webinar we won, we looked at what is the reason for fog. And in, in many cases, it's just, either lack of vision, lack of leadership, lack of a plan, lack of goals, um, and lack of, um, let's say, feedback loop inside an organisation. I'm sort of thinking as well, you know, you're saying a a business has to have a great vision. It almost sounds to me like, um, you know, if you were to add some some subheaders under that, listening, intense listening, I think was the sort of phrase you used. Yes. And the need for empathy as well. Absolutely, absolutely. To, to um, sort of I, I think guide your employees. Is, yeah, I, I think the term is active listening. It's different from That's listening. Yeah. And you know, this, this is this is a, this is something that has to be learned. It's it's not something that people find easy. How often do you find yourself listening to someone and you're you're passing an opinion in your mind, or you're saying, "Oh, in my own mind, I don't believe this." What what's all this garbage about? Active listening is is putting aside and being absolutely present, and it's just allowing what you're hearing to be absorbed. Yeah. Do you, do you encourage sort of note-taking with that? Um, I tend not to take too much note-taking um, during active listening because that's just a distraction. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> so just absorbing it in your mind. So typically, when I, when I work with executives and, or, or some senior business managers in, in that sense, typically, you know, active listening and absorbing it, there will be a question that will come from it. And the, the, the power of the questions, um, the quality of the questions that, that a CEO is asked will actually to deliver the quality of outcomes. And um, inquiry um, in, in the sense of um, what you're hearing, what, what's been fed back to you, the inquiry leads the person that's talking down a, down a, down a path of, of um, self-appreciation, 
that leads them down a path of understanding themselves. And, and you know, what I'm going to say is quite controversial, but understanding yourself leads to a better understanding of the business. And so when you say understanding yourself, you mean understanding how you've got to this position where they're in front of you, for example. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And, and how, how you can influence an organisation. To how you can improve going forward. Yes. Right. Some of the subtle things that um, have big meaning for other people. Okay. What, what would some of those sort of things be in your experience? Look, the, the, it could be as, as simple as consistency. Um, you know, you, you're, you're doing one thing for the senior team and you're doing another thing for perhaps someone else or saying one thing for one person and saying another to other. That small thing in your mind could have massive implications in, your, in the total workforce. Right. Interesting. Okay. So do you find that where things are at, that basically is there a shift now taking place where things are going away now from just the end numbers to actually going more sort of, how can I put it, employee and customer centric and saying, if we get that right, then that will take care of the numbers. Is that happening? Is, is that gradually taking place? Yeah, there is, there is some shift, but we, we, I think we must remain cognizant of the fact that there, there needs to be um, some form of performance and performance management and understanding of what that means. Because with the best will in the world, but a, a company that's not reaching break even or turning over what it needs to um, can't implement some of those things. But I think that, that, that said, there's definitely a move to, to looking at um, the customer, looking at uh, what their expectations are, uh, is definitely a big shift in, the, in, that, in that field. And you've seen that um, during the COVID and the lockdown period. We've seen people um, employing a lot more empathy to the needs of people. We've, we've seen a lot more um, helping hands go out to people to understand their situations. And we've had companies both boom and bust, you know, so equally they've been doing those sorts of things. Yeah, interesting. And th this, is, this is the humdinger question. <laughs> Thinking of culture... When you're, when you're putting these processes in place or improving behavior, particularly at the top, how do you measure it? Is it as simple as you start seeing a vision statement? Are there any other things that you look at and go, that is potentially a metric and sign of success? Yeah, there could be any number of things. Typically, a board, a board will be looking for two things, or they'll be looking, well, is there actually a return on investment? And are we seeing some form of gain? Um, that's one thing. And then there's these sort of intangible things. Well, how do we measure organisational culture? How do, we, how do we measure that? And, of course, in the short term, that can be difficult. But if we stick with the 360-degree review process for those senior executives, and if we're starting to see the, the, um, the metrics around those change and we're starting to get ratings lifting in that area, then what we're saying here is we're getting behavioural shift. And with behavioural shift, we should see the numbers or the other metrics uh, improving that we're, we're uh, attempting to shift. Can you improve the leadership and therefore the culture of any organisation, in your opinion? Or are there some leaders where that's maybe not possible? And I, I, I asked that question to give you a little bit of context. I'm thinking... You know, certainly into the 80s and 90s, from what I've read, a real sort of numbers culture emerged. <laughs> and, and, and the argument, I think, given by the likes of Simon Sinek is it encouraged the, uh, the sociopaths <laughs> to take control. Are some leaders um, beyond reach or, or do you think anyone can be I, I think to answer that question, um, I'll answer it in two ways. There are some people that are closed to growing and developing and um, examining themselves and having someone critique them and s sit by them. Those that are open to um, understanding what they can um, do to improve, then absolutely we can change, we can help, we can shift, we can shift any organisation. There are some leaders that unfortunately we can't change. 
Uh, it's just their their makeup, and you know, there's nothing right and wrong about anyone's makeup. That's just the state of fact. But if we can get the new generation of managers, CEOs, executives coming through that have a different mindset around um, organisational improvement, um, starts with improving themselves, then you know we've come a long way to um, shift any organisation, be it community based, be, whether it be government based, whether it be private enterprise based. So your message effectively is change your own behavior to help change the behavior of those under your charge. And that in turn will then take care of the numbers alongside alongside a big vision that inspires everyone to power forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Vision and um, understanding myself. Because if we think about it, where we've come from, we come from a place where the leader gets up, bangs his hand on the table blames every, everyone for failing un, underneath them and then replaces them and moves on. You know, those, those days are <laughs> definitely gone. You know, there's a couple of business organisations that work from this country that have absolutely destroyed their business, destroyed the market by taking that approach. Yeah, yeah, okay. So if we were to look at um, some of today's leaders, not necessarily um, in the business world, so if we look at... <laughs> America, even the United Kingdom, and maybe France or some of the others. <laughs> what is your, without getting too political, what is your take on some of these leaders? Do you see a big vision from any of them? No, not particularly. <laughs> How's that for an answer? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm thinking, because when you said it, I was thinking, what, what is the big vision for the UK? And I, I'm slightly struggling, uh, you know, post-Brexit world is all I can think of. <laughs> well, you know, I think we've had nibbles. We've had nibbles of this, you know, and in, in, uh, releasing the shackles is one part of that vision, creating a technology-based um, uh, manufacturing uh, or um, uh, business-based uh, opportunity is another. We've heard nibbles about all kinds of things. But if we all had clarity on the big vision, and how it's broken down, how every person in this country could attach themselves to one aspect of it, because everyone's never going to like everything that's produced, but if they can attach themselves to one small aspect, no matter how small or big that might be, then there's a real opportunity to take the country forward. Now, I'm not a politician, but that's just how it seems to me in business as well. Yeah, very interesting, very interesting. So do you think... Culture has been really tested to the max in terms of obviously we've been locked down. People aren't face to face as much, if at all. Um, so is, is there a danger that distance has literally created distance between teams? Are you seeing any of that? Yes, definitely. Um, if we reflect back in the times where the railways dominate our countries and our businesses to a large extent um, and then come air travel, and that, that completely shifted um, how we might do business, how we might um, ship uh, materials and products around the world. And I, I look at it in the same fashion that, you know, if, if we don't consider the, the broader and the long-term implications of what we've experienced having to work from home to um, look at our businesses in a different way, it's been a really, you know, I hate to say it, it's been a, quite a sad time, but if we don't look at it, um, from a perspective of what we can learn and how we can now adapt our businesses, not just for the next three or four or five years, but what is the change process that we're going to bring about that we're always constantly reviewing a, a new way, a better process? How can we involve our people? How can we involve thought leadership across the organisation? I think um, that will be a, of enormous benefit to um, this country. Mm, mm, interesting. I'm sort of thinking if you're an employee, Given what you, what we've discussed, if you're an employee, whatever level, is it possible for an employee to slowly start driving change in terms of cultural change from below? I, I think there's definitely um, an opportunity. the The danger the employee faces is not being heard, mm-hmm. and not being heard means a, a person's going to disconnect. And they might not outwardly disconnect, but they've disconnected somewhere. And that's the last thing we want. So, you know, having having a, a mechanism to allow allow that change and, and reflect upwards as well as downwards um, is, is something absolutely worthwhile considering. Yeah, interesting. So, I mean, could they sort of form a group with like-minded people to gradually 
drive change from below? Some of the great businesses or organisations across the world have consultative teams and, and the, the danger of those consultative teams becoming politicised or or seeded um, means they, they, they serve another end. But, you know, the idea of consultative teams or consultative people across um, every aspect of the organisation where that consultative organisation, everyone comes in on a, on a sort of equal footing, that's hugely powerful if it's used in the right way. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Are there any, um, other than, you know, the likes of Musk and formerly Jobs, are there any other business leaders that you look up to and go, that's a great, that's a great character, a great template? <laughs> yeah, there's, like, there's, there's, there's a lot around. I, I won't name them, but there, there, is, there is some great um, uh, organisations or great movements going on. And, and one in particular that I follow and it excites me about the future is, exponential um, organizations or businesses and the, I, I think you'll find that if some, someone wants to pick that up and follow I can give you the details of that they're going to see the net where the, the future businesses are going to come from and future businesses are not going to own assets they're not going to have um, big investment in in bricks and mortar this is going to be data and um, digital driven, digitally driven that's very interesting is that because those businesses can because they're digital they're almost borderline borderless. So does that mean that they can scale so much quicker than, than the um, businesses and industries of the past? Yes. Yeah, so if we consider, you know, the business of the past, where you know, a scale meant opening an office, bricks and mortar, um, and other assets we had to invest in. You know, if, if that can be flipped on its head, where there's very little investment in terms of bricks and mortar and um, infrastructure. Um, the new digital ways, especially around the use of data, allows us to scale very, very quickly and fast. And you're seeing, you know, a lot of the, the leading um, organisations in the, in, you know, the private and listed businesses, you'll find that a lot of them are, are leaning towards um, that, that, that type of business. Yeah. So, I mean, I think most of the most valuable business, businesses in the world today you know, didn't really exist or hardly existed 25, 30 years ago, the, the, the speed of scale is, is immense. Yeah, but if you look at Amazon, you look at iTunes, you look at um, Apple, they, you know, they don't, they don't own a lot of asset. Um, they, they sell or more move other people's uh, produce. Yeah, very clever. So given that, and given that it sounds like you're saying there's going to be a hell of a lot more of that going on, I, I presume things like blockchain, um, 3D printing potentially even, and, and all these sorts of things will, will give rise to more and more of these businesses. That means culture has never been more important because arguably, and, and feel free to correct me on this, but there's nothing harder than, than running a scaling operation. There's so many moving parts and things that the dynamics are changing so rapidly. You need every bit of help as a leader that, that you can get. Yeah, and I'll come back to that clear vision. If, if there's a clear vision and everyone that's involved in that organisation is clear, although they understand it has change, but they're bought into it, you know, it makes those, those sorts of transitions that much easier. Yeah. Thinking of vision, what, 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 where do you start with a vision? Have you, have you done any of that sort of work with organisations as to developing a vision? Absolutely. Yeah, the, the three key things are vision, which is the picture of what does the business or organisation look like when it's finished. The mission, you know, there's a lot of mystery around that. It's simply how we get there and the values and how we treat each other inside the organisation. They're the three key things. And there's no mystery about it. If you boil it down to those, those simple definitions, you can go a long way. Does, does a vision have to be achievable or can it be something that we're always striving to improve to get to? Yeah, it, it could be the penultimate. It could be the absolute best possible outcome. But, you know, normally a vision is something we, we're always aspiring to achieve. We can have goals. Goals are different from vision. Goals are in five years, we, will, we might have this, this and this, or three years we'll have this, this and this. But the vision might be something bigger than ourselves, bigger than the organisation. For example, our vision is we want to be able to positively impact a million people by helping 20,000 businesses. And, and the reason I say that is imagine the impact you can have on an economy, on communities, if every business 
um, in Oxfordshire could employ one more person. Imagine wow. the impact. Imagine the abundance we could bring to our communities. Yeah, yeah. So you're right. So it's it's a lot bigger than just the organisation. There, you're, you're talking about yeah society almost a, a, as a whole there, and and the opportunity that that could bring to improve yeah. people's living standards. If yeah, if if more people employ more people, yeah, very interesting. Okay. And the, I mean, the mission statement, do you, this, now that's, this is fascinating. Mission is, as you say, I think that's clouded. There's a bit of fog around mission. <laughs> but do, do you find that, do leaders need to have their own personal mission statement as well as an organisation one? Yeah, look, you know, a lot of times people struggle with their, their own purpose in life um, and what, what their why is, you know, the, and, you know, why do we exist? What, what is the purpose? And there's three three different sort of levels of, of the purpose. One is to be the best of ourselves. The one is, another one might be to leave the world in a better place. You know, when we start breaking that down, once we understand who we are and, and the contribution we can make, not only to, to the organisation we're attached to, but also the wider community, then, then attach a lot more meaning to, to themselves. And then once we've got meaning to ourselves, vision becomes very, very easy to create. Right. So you have to start with a mission and the vision is likely to come off that. Is that right? No, no. The vision. Oh, you've got to start with the vision. The, picture. the vision is the picture okay. of the future. And once right. you've got a once you've got a, a vision, something that you can actually see in your own mind or draw a picture or or verbalize it or write it down. Um, and then um, the process from there is, well, how do we get there? That's the mission. And okay. what are we? What are the key things along the way? Which are the goals? And what are we going to do? We break it down into the actions. And values. It's so how we treat each other. Behaviors, yeah. Behaviors, yeah. 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 Do you find? I mean, a lot of organisations over the years have had values printed up on the wall, <laughs> but everybody yeah. walks past them. Doesn't doesn't necessarily exactly. take any notice. I, I work for a very very large um, French company, and I work for a very large uh, distribution company in this in in this country, and they had all their their values and mission, but no no one no one believed them. No one saw them. They were too heavy and clunky that people couldn't remember them. And now, if you can't remember them, what use are they? Yeah. 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 So keep them simple. Keep them absolutely simple. Yeah. And do they need to be built into leadership decisions? Do they need to be just do decisions need to be justified according to the values, mission and vision? Well, obviously, vision is quite obvious, but. Absolutely. So any decision um, needs to go through a sort of thought process. How, how well does this ad- um, how can we adapt this or how well does this align to our vision or how well does this align to the things we're going to do to achieve our mission? And um, absolutely, they, they all have to be crucial. They have to be integrated. They can't be just something that's on a poster stamp or stuck on the wall and, oh, well, we've done that, tick the box, move on. It has to be absolutely integral to everything we do. Mm, mm, fascinating. Interesting. So do you-, you, probably, you know, if you start talking about the values, a lot of organisations will have value statements, you know, you know, spread through cross government, local local government, and organisations. But are we really, are we really employing those? Do we believe? Um, does our, our mindset allow us to, to um, have the headspace to bring those values into what we do every every day? And, and I would suggest um, that not so much. There are some organisations that do that. There are some organisations that don't. So decisions in relation to interactions with customers or clients should always take into account in doing this, are we sticking to our values, question mark? Correct. And, you know, one of the biggest coaching questions I have when I'm asked a tricky question, well, should we do this and should we do that? And I'll put it right back to them and I'll say, well, what are your values? What would your values say about that? Um, And quite often it's about employee engagement or should we do this or should we do that with people? And and we all know the answers. If we simply ask ourselves, what would, it, what would our values say about this? What would that state? And you'll have the answer immediately. So if I think back to the crash, <laughs> the banking crash, getting back to the banks, <laughs> yeah. 
Or it could be argued, therefore, a lack of adherence to values or creation of values was a huge part of the, uh, how can I put it, greed? <laughs> demise. That led, that, that led to the demise of the system. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I suspect that might have something to do with it. You know, the word integrity, um, honesty sort of spring to mind. So, so greed is good is not a value, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. Interesting. So you're doing more of this kind of work with people. It's gradually creeping in, is it? Part of, part of your role? Strangely enough, inside business coaching, we always start with those three things. Uh -huh. It has to be a clear direction. Once we've got things clear, then the fog's lift with people. How do we get on with each other? I've just started to see it at a different level. That it, it, It's almost like this is the sort of hierarchy of thinking that needs to be brought into an organisation. Very interesting. So actually, if you're say, an entrepreneur who's starting out, yes, you may have your amazing product or service or IT-based service, whatever that may be, database. But once you have that idea, next point, next point, next step is, next key, crucial step is vision, mission, vision. values, mm -hmm. and everything else stems off of there, right? Correct. Absolutely. Fascinating. So you haven't got that. Arguably, you've got an organization that, that might eat itself from the inside out, potentially. Yeah. And, you know, it might grow. It might, it, things might go, but you know, we want to we want to give ourselves the best possible opportunity to succeed. Yeah, very interesting, fascinating. Yeah, so you have to have those essential building blocks in place to make it happen. Well, let me flip this back to you. Okay. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> if, you're, if you're if you're working for a big organization and you didn't didn't believe in the direction they were heading, and you didn't believe in the values. Um, the plastic they were pumping into the ground or the pollution that was a result of that. How would you feel about that organisation? Do you think you would help them make it successful? I'd be wasting my time. Right, so you'd I'd have to be wasting answer. my time getting out of bed in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, we weren't aligned in how we were thinking. And so, yeah, yeah, good yeah, point. alignment is, is really, really important, and that's another thing that we do um, in terms of, of our executive coaching is aligning the, but the personal goals with the organisational goals. Now, if they are incongruent, then that leader ain't going to work. It's just not going to work. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Well, it uh, certainly has given me plenty of food for thought, and I, I really appreciate your time. Is, is there anything else you want to add to any of that that we haven't discussed, that I haven't asked? Well, you know, I, I think the, the only message I would leave um, is vision to remove the fog and uh, awareness of self are the two big drivers of leadership um, in modern day organizations self-awareness so seeing how other people see you yeah a bit of empathy yeah yeah so we need empathy is is, is a key thing in this whole thing listening and empathy and understanding mm -hmm. how others are feeling in terms of your actions absolutely right yeah Sociopaths need not apply. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyone, anyone can be changed or if they have the desire for themselves to be changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. It starts with, it starts with how we think. Um, and I suppose another thought to leave um, yourself and, and your audience is that how we think is, a, re, is reflected inside the organisation. So if our thinking doesn't change, then the organisation doesn't change. So if it's up here, yeah. it will become. It will become. What we think is what we get. Right. I need to get some big ideas going again. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily Lamborghinis or anything like that, though. <laughs> well, you know, why not? You know, if, if, that, if that's truly what you want, then why, why shouldn't you aim to receive it? Why, you know, why not? Yeah. No, I, I, think, I think it's... That's it's vision, isn't it? Mental vision. That's a very interesting point. Yeah. And what you, if just touching on that subject, you'd be thinking that every morning when you get up, what's whatever the vision may be. You know, if your passion for what your vision is strong enough, you're going to be visualizing that you're going to be thinking of it, um, uh, you know, a lot of the time. 
if you go back to, you know, I could be careful what I say here, but if you go back to when, when you're in your younger days and, and you're attracted to a, a, a particular person, you know, there was a certain degree of passion. There was a certain amount of constant thought um, around that other person you were attracted to. Now, if your vision is that strong when you're thinking about it in that similar fashion, and, and that might be about structured thought in the morning and structured thought in the evening uh, to remind yourself, then if those, if those thoughts and passions are strong enough, you will eventually get it. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, very good. But in this case, in this, in this case it's more about a vision for the team and the organization as a whole, or, or in your case, you're actually talking about an impact on society. Correct. Yeah. So you're thinking about that regularly throughout the day. Every, every waking moment I have is how can I influence businesses to have an impact upon those million people in the Oxfordshire region? Yeah. Brilliant. I think that that is a great point on which to end it. And, uh, I can't thank you enough. It's fascinating, really interesting. And, uh, I really appreciate your time. My pleasure, Chris, any time. Cheers. Cheers. A big thank you to my guests for joining us and imparting so much knowledge. If you haven't done so already, then be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Alternatively, you can subscribe to Beyond the Numbers on your preferred podcast app. I'll be back soon with another episode. Do also get in touch with your feedback using the hashtag beyond the numbers. And you can tweet me at Thompson CST and at Wellers SME. Beyond the Numbers is a Wellers production.